introduce uh, Marcus, uh, Dr. Marcus Bowles, who's the Adjunct Deputy Director of, v of VET and Industry Research at the University of Tasmania. And uh, hopefully he'll uh, take us on another journey when it talks about emerging, in emerging industries. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, now, I didn't collude with the other two presenters, but I'm going to give the same information in a completely different way. Um, which is probably useful for you because then you can triangulate what I'm saying. Now, in deference to Nina as well, um, I have to start off with, let me tell you a story. I'll come back to that one. That was going to be the last slide on the presentation until about a month ago. And I was going to tell you all about how we engage with industries and how we use technologies and the wonderful convergence that's going on and all the rest of it. And it was all a conversation about how. And it was worrying me. And I had two meetings on the same day with two very different boards of management and one executive team with two organisations. Working Futures does restructures and it does the reskilling, looking into the future horizons probably five to ten years ahead. And I did the head slap moment. Really did the head slap moment. And the reason for that was because it was the wrong conversation to have. What I need to have the conversation about is in actual fact why. I need to talk to you about why things are changing, why industry looks differently. Why, when you're looking at emerging industries, there's particular factors that we need to go back over. And the key reason for that is that, as you've heard and as I'll reinforce, there is an emerging gap, increasing gap, between how vocational education and training and universities, who are pushing towards more being vocational than educational, are missing how we consume skills in industry. So I need to explain why that's occurring. And the head slap for me was I just had two conversations with employers who also forget the fundamentals and what they're trying to do. So I want to go back over some key points about what's changing, why it's changing, and actually focus in on a number of factors about the nature of work, the nature of change, and I know it's going to be boring, some 101 stuff about how work is changing due to the nature of economic trends without talking about economic trends. I want to start talking about the nature of knowledge. Educator in me. I want to talk about why, for instance, competencies are insufficient. Why we've had conversations about some of the things that are changing. I want to talk to you about the profiling of work that we do with companies. So at the moment, over the last five years, we sat down and started to trawl through the job profiles of the future work for the companies we're building to look at in the future and for startups. And it doesn't look like anything that you're seeing at the moment. Okay, so let's go back to the 101 basics. There's three types of change. Episodic, continuous and disruptive. When we look at episodic change, it's quite simple. It changes at a work level. It changes a task. The nature of change in this circumstance is, excuse the crude language, a sparrow's fart in a major change environment. It doesn't really change anything other than the immediate task. When we're looking at continuous, the continuous change is occurring so often so fast that we start to lose the fact that this is a major change that's occurring. And it's going over a long period of time, and once one change starts, it gets continuous momentum, and we get a critical mass, and it's ongoing, particularly for commercial reason. Think about how you consume music. I was trying to explain to my son the other day what this plastic thing was, it was a spool that you put into things and it used to play music. And then I thought just for the you know, hell of it, I'd say, we used to put down things in front of the TV and try to record the music on the TV so we could actually hear it before it was on the radio. And blank, 18-year-old look. It's like trying to explain to him what happened when um, he was watching a 70s car chase. And he says, why don't they ring ahead and tell the people to block them? And I go, there are no mobile phones in the 70s. Okay. And we have disruptive change. We hear these words all the time. I'm trying to reinforce the difference and why they're important to know. Disruptive change has a massive impact on the immediate econ economy, on how business is structured and what you're doing. So if you're looking at this one, we're looking at electricity coming in and changing over from gas. All change is not the same. Change is different. We are in an age of continuous, disruptive change. When you look at the digital economy and you have conversations with executives, 
they're only just starting to understand the nature of how much the marketplace is changing for them in the immediate future. I sit there and start talking about predictions that are not predictions, that we actually know the technology already exists. And we have conversations, for instance, when we're looking at optimist restructure and we're saying, why are we focusing on mobile infrastructure? Because we know damn well within the next five years you'll be wearing technology. Not the iPad strapped to your wrist and all the rest of those wonderful things. You are the internet connection. Wherever you go, you can pick up a device and you'll make a connection with that device and the device will go, oh, that's who you are. And it will connect to your cloud-based files and everything else you need with your preferences already set, with your music that you're now consuming through multiple different modes and you can watch a TV episode that you missed as well on any device wherever that device is, not just your mobile phone, not just a TV, not just a computer. We're talking about ubiquity of access that if I was talking about it to tell you why and how you could change um, is going to have great and profound implications on learning. But it's changing right now, for instance, how we're designing superannuation. Go figure. Superannuation. So one of my conversations that day went from a telco to a superannuation board. And they were talking about high-touch customer service using telepresence and automation over the internet to a person who's wearing a computer. Because we need to be ready now to do that three to four years when it's predicted to come in. Okay, can you see what I'm saying? We're in a disruptive period of change. Okay, so let's get down to the conversation that you're really here to talk about. A hundred years ago, we had a connected society that was being driven in what I would call the second wave of industrialization. After the steam, we had the combustion engine and electricity. We're now in the, in the era where we're talking about a connected society not being about electricity. But a hundred years ago, you have a read of the papers, we're talking about, oh, we've got this new business that's actually using electricity to actually produce these things faster. Oh, and we've got this car manager. We talked about business using the technology as a way of classifying it. The conversation today, we talk about a connected society, we talk about the technology and we talk about how we're going to do business because of certain technologies. We aren't today talking about, oh, you use electricity that way. Oh, do you have a flicking switch when you go home? Over time, technology becomes invisible. We are still in a learned consciousness phase trying to understand how technology is going to impact us. We're still talking about the technology, not what it does. So, let me give you a money's worth about some notes and reflect on exactly what's been said from a different perspective. I guess I come from an educational, organisational design and I make money out of helping companies to design these things. I also have conversations with the university to try and get them to understand that education's training has changed and we need new pathways. The first note is the most important. The business models you're seeing in industry today will change. Old, new, how we classify it, business models are changing radically. So if you want to improve relevance of what you're doing to the emerging models, you can't use your past business paradigms. You can't assume your clients in industry are you thinking the same way about skills that they were five years ago. And it might be slower in some industries, but it will change. Let me talk about slow pace, fast pace. Kahneman was a uh, prized author on many things and uh, from my point of view he borrowed what we knew in economic history when I did it in undergraduate about God knows how long ago. I won't go there. It's probably 25 years ago. We had old and new industries. Michael talked about it. Now we talk in fast-paced, slow-paced thinking. Same concept, just modernised. Fast is what I make my money doing when I'm in the corporate world. It's about creating agile systems. It's about recognising that when you're going through, and this is a very old presentation, sorry, when you're going through the particular style of change, what you're looking at is you're trying to compete on actually identifying future opportunities, on creating a close relationship with the customer. And it's all about, in system one, being able to target what you're doing to the needs. When you talk about it in industry development terms, it's new. 
It's not a mature, it's a new industry. It isn't going to be about how businesses have been built in the past. When we put together the business models in this space, what we're looking to do is, in actual fact, it's going to be about customization. It's going to be about high responsiveness. It's going to be about short lead times. It's going to be about products that don't sit on shelves for very long and services that are delivered right to the person where they want it, when they want it, how they want it, and it will be customised to their particular needs. It's talking about getting on a wave of growth, particularly in the global economy, which is about high multiplier, high value, early entry into a market that's going to grow rapidly. But you need to hold on for dear life because you can't put a standardised product into that marketplace because it won't work. And then we have slow to change, system two. Slow to change are really about trying to create a business model which we are seeing a lot of people trying to hold on to where in actual fact, unlike the agile companies which welcome turbulence and want to seize an opportunity, the whole aim is to grab a market share, hold on to that market share, try to protect yourself from any environmental turbulence that might change your customers' preferences, make sure that you standardise all your production systems, remove waste, remove your cost and try and get your prices down so you can compete. It's about looking back. A lot of these industries are about traditional skilling models, about highly routinised jobs, because we have products that can be standardised and can exist for a long period of time. We can do the same thing and get better at trying to do the same thing over time and skilling for that. Does that make sense? So, so we've got system one, faster, system two, slower. So the business paradigm is moving a lot more to system one. When we look at that and then we come to the next point, and that is that a vocational outcome is by no means, will not and cannot look like an occupation in the future. Now I'm talking about emerging industries. I'm talking about emerging industries. The first thing about that is that the occupational paradigm that drives the national funding model for the vocational education and training system does not work. You cannot expect ANSCO and ANSIC classifications, how we define industries and occupations, and Michael put up a, he's gone so, I'll now at liberty to say, you look in there and I look for an emerging industry in those models, you won't see it. It doesn't tell you where the growth is going to come from. It told the old industries because we're using that. If our education and training and our skills demand is going to be based on what's coming out of the ABS, we will miss the point. If we're going to fund education and training solutions that are tightly aligned to levels and to occupations, nice little grid, there's the box, go and fill it, won't work for emerging industries. And the major reason it won't work is because a job in emerging industries does not exist at a level on the AQF. And if you look at our 1,600 job profiles that were done for five clients in the last eight months, and if you look at the survey of national ICT companies which are in the, the high technology growth areas that the Australian Computer Society just did, 10,000 strong survey response, not one job role, not one job role fitted into one skills council. We have job roles out there at the moment where employment is enormously fast growing. They don't align to one of the occupational classifications. And I could put many, many more up there, but I thought they'd get too small and then I'd get shot. So we can't find, in the way that we're building new companies to meet new business paradigms, unless they're highly technical, highly routinised, a neat allocation of job roles to what's required to do that job and an occupational classification and a training package with a qualification and a competency skill set. The alignment is not there. The next thing is job profiles redefine demand for applied contextual skills and knowledge. So let me divert the attention to focus on personal skills and knowledge. John and I use a de definition of capability very differently. But it's all about capabilities when we're talking about it from a human development or from a human capital point of view in business. But from an educational point of view, the first note is knowledge structure that is required 
does build off the basis in vocational education and training. But what we talk about is underpinning knowledge and skills and about technical skills is the start point. What's highly valued in emerging industries, in actual fact, is the ability to put that knowledge and skills into a context and then, in actual fact, to apply experience and understanding to change how you perform in that context. We're talking about more complex jobs with more variety in skills and knowledge and competencies are only the starting point. So where we focus in VET, in actual fact, from a personal point of view and what we recruit for, is only about one quarter, and in value terms, I'd hate to say in value terms what it's really worth, we have to have the preconditions of technical and functional competence, but if we want to be agile, if our company is being built on our ability to change and respond, it is a lot more value in how you think, how you act, how you behave in context for the range of variables that are going to affect you. Okay, so having said training packages, competencies, qualifications are only a bit of the puzzle and they're not quite fitting what we need anyway, now I'm about to say it's not about qualifications. At this moment in time, the best of our knowledge in working futures and working with BIS Shrapnel and others to try and get real data on private spend on education training, at best, the public VET system is only about one third of the spend in technical and vocational education training that companies will work on. In real terms, we would say that it's really hard for online education. We would say that in actual fact, we're looking at around about 28 to 30 billion dollars being spent in in-house education training, vendor certification, compliance, blah, 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 blah. That sits outside the VET sector, not because the VET sector isn't delivering what industry want. Industry would love to see the VET sector deliver what they want. The answer is at the end of the day, it's not even packaged the way that they can consume it. Business doesn't want to spend its money educating people to come in with base level personal behaviours, what we would call soft skills, plus competencies, plus the right attitude. Love to be able to just get that, thank you very much. It's not going to happen. Business has to spend money to be competitive, and a lot of it's unique to us and our company. Absolutely right. But at the moment, the marketplace is telling you, right now the spend in the VET sector is not in the right place, because business alone should not be spending that much on reskilling people. The system we're in at the moment is supply driven. Okay, go back to the paradigms of system two. We made it, we standardised it, we're going to focus on cost reduction, quality, ratcheting the system to give you a better result and all the rest of it. And our market share is going to be really important. Well, the market share isn't there. Business is not spending all its money in the VET system. In fact, in some areas, there's a 42% decline since 2009 on spend from businesses in traineeships. Yet in most areas we need more. What's going on? And the reason is we have a supply system. We need to have a conversation about mass customization, about the right product for the right solution. So let's have a conversation about micro credentials. These are, I'm throwing so many ideas at you in a short and rapid period of time while I've got you as a captured audience. We have now major educational providers investing huge mega millions of dollars in new recognition systems that are targeting employers' needs. Employers are working with universities as vocational providers and with vocational providers acting as universities as well, because they don't seem to have the same conversation. And they're talking about credential and transitions, career pathways. And it's all about this person's readiness to work for us at this level of work. Not the skills and knowledge. It's talking about credentials where we're transitioning workforces from being an old occupation to in actual fact being a new role. A combination of skills and knowledge and capabilities, to use John's use of that word, so that we're talking about employability based on what you can do, but in a context that's very specific to a workplace and an industry, in the emerging language, to the emerging requirement. 
we keeping those and storing them? We're lining them to competencies, doing all the right things, but about 60% has nothing to do with national training system. We have a whole organisation employing around about 40,000 people that is micro-credentialing your culture, your values, your personal fit with our organisation. Talking about how well you can work here. So, fast industries, Michael covered this in detail, so I'll skip through it. We know where industries are emerging in Tasmania and where growth factors will be. They are all not going to be System 1, new, agile, fantastic, shiny new businesses. A lot of this is going to be about the more mature System 2s, in actual fact spinning off smarter, higher growth, higher multiplier type business activities. So where are they? We've already talked about it. I've been lucky because a couple of the national clients actually work in Tasmania. There's very little work being done in Tasmania, in my opinion, of high value that relates to, for instance, the size and dimension of new manufacturing. But I can tell you now, if we're not in that space now and starting to skill and put the capabilities into our workforce to do that, right now, the businesses will not come here. They will not come here. But we've got fantastic opportunities. We already have an example where I was working in the northwest, uh, in actual fact with Dan and other people within the Elphinstone group and within the group of manufacturers in a cooperation where Skills Tasmania did the first in, Tas first in Australia. We will fund the skills not based on level or training package, but the demand that relates to the transition across the whole of the supply chain. Oh my God. If we can do that in other places, where we can actually identify the alignment of the opportunities, break away from the existing funding model, it gives us a sustainable competitive advantage. Business will come here in the emerging and high technology areas. So, not only System 2, but also System 1. So it's not just a conversation about all new businesses being what we should focus on. It's about making sure our skill system can enable the businesses of the future from even System 2 companies. Help them break the mindset. And I'll skip through these. So what's the message? The message is quite simple. We're not in episodic change. Don't assume you can just ratchet the system and do a bit of e-learning and change how you're going to be doing this and a bit more flexibility here and maybe we can tinker with the funding model here. If you want to attract emerging businesses, if you want to help make sustainable the traditional businesses that we're really good at in, this, in Tasmania, then we need to understand that this is not episodic change. And we're in disruptive, continuous change. You have to change your own business paradigm and as a system... We have to change how we fund and support vocational education and training to support the new business paradigms. In other words, if I had the conversation and ended with the first slide and told you what we could do, we are still treating this as a sequence of just, just do a bit of improvement. You can, you can do it better. If you want to build new businesses, become one yourself. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marcus. And uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, certainly, um, the interesting thing around the the hammer is it was often told to me that um, sometimes when you've got a hammer, everything else looks like everything you want to do needs to be a nail. So maybe it's a case of taking the type of thinking that uh, has been proposed to us in the last three or four speakers to actually uh, take those to heart and start thinking about what exactly we're going to be doing. Uh, on that note, we've been sitting sitting still for uh, a little while, so.